This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 73. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's new Psyche mission to a metallic asteroid, a new hypothesis to try and explain the Tunguska event, and the International Space Station forced to make a course change because of space junk. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Construction's now underway on NASA's new spacecraft to explore the metal-rich main belt asteroid 16 Psyche. The huge 279-kilometre-wide space rock contains about 1% of the total mass of the entire asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Scientists think that, unlike most other asteroids, which are either rocky or icy bodies, Psyche is largely metallic iron and nickel, similar to Earth's core. In fact, it's thought to be the exposed core of a differentiated protoplanet that was torn apart, losing its crust and mantle in some titanic ancient collision. And since we can't examine Earth's core up close and personal, exploring the asteroid psyche could provide some useful and valuable insights into how Earth and the other terrestrial worlds formed. The psyche mission is slated for launch in August 2022. And with approval for construction, the mission has now moved from the planning and designing phase into the actual manufacture of the spacecraft and its systems. Like all NASA missions, the early work on Psyche began with drawing up the digital blueprints. Then came the building of engineering models. These were then tested and retested to confirm the systems would do their job once they're in deep space. Finally, there was the key stage which has just occurred, the critical design review. That's when NASA examines the designs of all the project systems, including the three main science instruments, as well as all the spacecraft engineering subsystems from telecommunications and propulsion through to powering the avionics and the flight computer. Mission scientists and engineers work together to plan the scientific instruments that will investigate Psyche. The Psyche spacecraft will study the asteroid's composition and surface features. It'll be equipped with a multispectral imager to photograph the surface and collect data about the composition and topography. There'll be a magnetometer to measure the asteroid's magnetic field. And there'll be spectrometers to analyze the neutrons and gamma rays coming from the surface in order to reveal the elements that make up the asteroid itself. The probe will also test the new deep space optical laser communication system. The mission team have already made prototypes and engineering models of the science instruments, as well as many of the spacecraft's engineering subsystems. These models are manufactured with less expensive materials than those that will fly on the actual mission so that they can be tested before the actual flight hardware is built. The idea is to understand down to seven or eight levels of detail exactly how everything on the spacecraft works together in order to ensure that it all performs as needed, allowing the science to be gathered and the data to be sent back to Earth. The components are first built individually. The main body of the spacecraft, called the Solar Electric Propulsion Chassis, is already being built at Maxa Technologies in Palo Alto, California. In fact, right now, engineers are working to attach the propulsion tanks. In February, Maxa will deliver the Solar Electric Propulsion Chassis to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory's main clean room at Caltech in Pasadena, California. And then they'll deliver the solar arrays, which provide all the power for the spacecraft systems, a few months later. And that marks the start of ATLO, NASA speak for assembly, test and launch operations. JPL, which is managing the whole mission, will provide the avionic subsystems, including Psyche's flight computer, the brains of the spacecraft. Right now, that equipment's all spread out on different racks in a clean room. Engineers are testing each piece separately before integrating it with the next. And once everything's connected, they'll test the full system with the software, operating the electronics exactly as it will be during the flight. Psyche project manager Henry Stern says the integrated system is so sophisticated, comprehensive testing is critical in order to expose and correct every problem now because, well, let's face it, you can't go out and fix the problem after launch. Psyche is set to fly in August 2022. It'll first travel to Mars for a gravity assist in May 2023 on its way to arrival at the asteroid in early 2026. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, 
Scientists have developed a new hypothesis to explain the lack of debris from the Tunguska event, the largest asteroid impact in Earth's recent history, and the International Space Station has been forced to make an unscheduled course correction in order to avoid a possible collision with a piece of space junk. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. One of the many things I love about The Great Courses Plus streaming service is getting to learn from actual experts who know what they teach. These are the people who actually carried out the research in the first place. Real professors have spent years studying their fields, researching and writing textbooks, and then imparting their knowledge to future generations of scientists. So they know how to teach and engage with people. These include people like Felix Lockman, Principal Scientist at the National Science Foundation's Green Bank Observatory, Alex Filipenko, Professor of Astronomy, and the Richard and Rhonda Goldman Distinguished Professor in the Physical Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley, David Meyer, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University, where he's also the Director of the Dearborn Observatory, Erica Carlson, the 150th Anniversary Professor and Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Purdue University, and the list goes on. I mean, where else, other than the Great Courses Plus, do you get access to such esteemed experts in their field? And I'm sure, like me, once you find a professor whose work you really love, you'll simply search out more and more of their courses so you can study and learn and find out more about this fabulous universe we live in. And of course, with the wide range of subjects available, The Great Courses Plus truly has something for everyone. You can delve into astrophysics, learn to become a writer, or practice mindfulness. And of course, with The Great Courses Plus app, you can learn anywhere and anytime. So it's easy to love this streaming service. But don't just take my word for it. Come and see for yourself. Sign up with The Great Courses Plus today. And right now, Space Time listeners have a free trial of unlimited access to the entire library. So what do you have to lose? Don't wait. Sign up today using our special URL. Start your free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. Sign up today. And if, like me, you have a thirst for knowledge, you won't regret it. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course, we'll include the URL details in the show notes and on our website. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And now, it's back to our show. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. On the morning of June the 30th, 1908, a massive explosion with the force of a 5 megaton thermonuclear device, equivalent of a 1,000 Hiroshima bombs, smashed into northern Siberia. The blast was so powerful, it lit up the night sky in London a third of the way around the planet with an orange glow, allowing Brits to read their evening newspapers without using artificial lighting. Seismographs a thousand kilometres away also recorded the event, sparking intense scientific interest. Researchers were able to triangulate the blast to the remote Tunguska River region of northern Siberia. But the place was so isolated, it took a scientific expedition 19 years to get there. What greeted them was a scene of utter devastation. The entire landscape had been flattened. The explosion raised some 80 million trees over an area of more than 2,000 square kilometres. Mature trees were simply snapped off at their bases, covering the ground for hundreds of kilometres like matches and all pointing away from what appears to be the epicentre, thought to be the location of what is now Lake Chico. Locals who witnessed the blast described a column of blue light moving across the sky in the cool summer's morning air, followed by a tremendous deafening explosion. The blast and the eyewitness accounts were all consistent with what would have been an asteroid impact, but mysteriously, no crater was ever found. And that's led scientists to speculate that the asteroid probably airburst before reaching the planet's surface. The idea of an airburst was also consistent with one of the unusual characteristics of the impact site. All those flattened trees pointed away from the blast zone, except that is for those at the very epicentre. Curiously, they remained upright. Computer simulations support the idea of an explosion caused by the airburst of a meteor somewhere between 1 and 200 metres across. Now, if it was a meteor, it may have come from the Beta Torrid's meteor shower, 
a debris trail left behind by the comet 2P Enki, which the Earth passes through twice every year in June and October. Enki itself is thought to be a piece of a much larger comet that broke apart between 20 and 30,000 years ago, following numerous interactions with the powerful gravitational field of Jupiter. Now, as the name suggests, the Taurid's radiant or apparent point of origin is in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. The Taurid's meteor shower is made up of larger, more massive material than most meteor showers. Think of pebbles instead of dust grains. That's because, as well as all the usual debris, produced as comets de gas and splatter fragments off into space from evaporating volatile material, Enki's orbit means it's also encountering gravitational tidal forces from Earth and other planets, causing larger chunks to break off as well. It all combines to make the Tored stream of material the largest meteor stream in the inner solar system. And since the meteor stream is rather spread out in space, Earth takes several weeks to pass through it, causing an extended period of meteor shower activity compared with the much smaller periods of activity from other meteor showers. Think weeks instead of days. Also included in the stream is a denser flow of gravelly meteoroids called the Torrid Swarm, thought to be a ribbon of rocks roughly 75 million kilometres wide by 150 million kilometres across and shepherded together by Jupiter's gravity. Occasionally, Earth passes through the larger meteoroids of the denser Torrid Swarm, and it's thought it was one of these larger chunks which may have caused the infamous Tunguska event. The idea of an airburst was supported by an examination of mineral debris trapped in peat from the blast area which was collected during the 1970s and 80s. Scientists using high-resolution imaging and spectroscopy identified polycrystalline aggregates of carbon minerals such as diamond, lonsdalite and graphite. Nanometer-sized particles of Lons Delight form together with diamond and graphite particles in carbon-rich material that's been suddenly hit by a shock wave, such as those that would be generated by a meteor impact. Scientists also found iron-nickel alloys, trollite and tainite, together with tiny inclusions of iron sulfides, all of which are often found in meteorites. So, the mineral composition found in the Tunguska peat all appears to be microscopic vestiges as evidence of what was the largest meteor impact in recorded history, and very similar to that found in the Canyon Diablo meteorite, which produced the famous Barringer impact crater in Arizona. So, mystery solved, right? Not yet. See, there's a problem, a big one, because there's simply no debris from an airburst. The thing is, when the 20 metre wide meteor airburst in the Siberian skies over Chelyablinsk back in 2013, fragments of the space rock were found scattered right across the landscape, even in a nearby lake. But other than those microscopic sized iron nickel grains we talked about, no fragments of the Tunguska meteor have ever been found. Certainly nothing comparable with Chelyablinsk. And that's led some scientists to explore alternative causes. Now, a new hypothesis in the monthly notices the Royal Astronomical Society argues there are no fragments because the asteroid never fragmented. Instead, it glanced off Earth's atmosphere and continued on through space. And that's not as revolutionary as it sounds. Meteors have been known to skip across the atmosphere. One example being the Great Daylight Fireball caused by a space rock the size of a bus, which was seen glancing off the upper atmosphere above Utah and Wyoming in 1972. The authors use computer modelling to explore several different scenarios, looking at different sized meteors, travelling at different angles and at different velocities. Eventually, they found that an iron asteroid about 200 metres in size, coming to within 10 kilometres of the Earth's surface at a shallow angle, would have remained largely unscathed and would continue orbiting the Sun. They claim the rapid compression of air near the asteroid would have been enough to create the blast region observed. To find out more... Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Professor Fred Watson. The Siberian Times uh, has um, come up with a new theory about how the uh, Tunguska event originated. Um, basically, that, that thing that happened over 100 years ago that flattened massive areas of Siberia uh, with um, that, that the shock wave of a, an asteroid impact. Now, according to the Siberian Times, another theory is that the asteroid didn't actually hit the Earth it skimmed the Earth and went back out the other side of the atmosphere. So um, how close might an asteroid skim by Earth without, uh, without crashing into it and or being pulled into the Earth's gravitational field? And how large is the size of the one that would skim Earth versus those that often uh, pummel our planet on a daily ba uh, basis? Uh, yeah, that, that's right. I actually saw that article as well. And I think it is a really interesting suggestion. So what prompts this 
suggestion that maybe it was something that basically grazed the earth. It skimmed through the atmosphere, detonated probably, uh, but then the bulk of it carried on on its journey through space. One of the reasons why people like that idea is that it's very hard to find any evidence of debris as a result of the Tunguska event. There's no single crater. People have looked at the whole landscape around there. It's full of lakes and there is a suggestion of a, a lump of something at the bottom of one of the lakes, but nothing that would account for the, the uh, 80 million trees that were essentially flattened by that explosion, which, if I remember rightly, was in 1908, as I think you mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, so the, if you postulate a grazing impact, then if you can make the physics work, and apparently they do, you can neatly answer why there's no meteorite, there's no asteroidal debris that has been found in the district. So how, how close might an asteroid skim by the Earth without crashing into it? and or be, being pulled into the Earth's gravitational field. So what it depends on is the speed of approach. You've got something that's going relative to the Earth. Let me do a quick calculation here. Less than about 11 kilometres per second, then it will probably hit the Earth because that's the Earth's escape velocity and it works backwards mm. as well as forwards. But most of these things are travelling much faster than that because the Earth's orbital velocity is 30 kilometres per second around the sun and asteroids are in orbits that give them a whole range of velocities as well. So you might get things up to perhaps 70 kilometres per second on the high end and you can get things that are low speed because you, you've got the asteroid and the Earth going in the same direction. So it all depends. If you have something going at a really high speed, then it will, and it would skim through the atmosphere, then it will be slowed down by the atmosphere, but not really significantly. And that might be the phenomenon that we've seen with this object. So you get a, an interaction with the atmosphere that is probably explosive and very likely to, to cause debris on the ground. But the height that this would happen, I'm guessing that you're talking about heights as near as 30 kilometres or something like that to the surface. Uh, that, wow. that would, if something was going fast enough, it would not be appreciably slowed down by the atmosphere, even at that sort of depth. But it would cause, if it was a big object in particular, it would cause quite a dramatic detonation of the outer layers at least. So the thing about asteroid impacts is a miss is as good as a mile. A, a miss of, uh, of 500 kilometres is much better because it doesn't interact with the atmosphere to speak of at all. Um, but if you've got something that penetrates deep into the atmosphere, and I'm saying you know, maybe 30 to 50 kilometres. I think 50 kilometres is the assumed height of the explosion at Tunguska. Then if it's going fast enough, it will keep on going. Once again, how big is the size? Well, it really is dependent on speed. What the size determines is how much of it comes out the other side of the atmosphere. If it's big enough, then there'll be still something left to fly on back in its orbit. If it's smaller than, and I would guess you're talking about 50 metres or something of that size, then you might get a complete detonation and will produce some debris on the ground, which is exactly what happened with the, the Chelyabinsk uh, episode, where yeah. there was an explosion 30 kilometres above the ground, and there's a debris field downstream of that. Uh, the biggest lump landed in a lake. That thing didn't carry on in its orbit around the sun, but basically was thought to be about 30, 20 to 30 metres across. The current situation with near-Earth objects is NASA is working very hard, um, or it's funding uh, observatories, at a very high level to determine everything, everything down to a size of about 140 metres. That's the, the current threshold. Now, something that big hitting us is definitely going to do city or statewide damage, but it doesn't wipe out civilization. So um, that's the current threshold for objects to be found. Uh, I think NASA, Congress mandated NASA to facilitate finding 90% of such objects because it's always a statistical thing. You never quite know where the last one's going to come from. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Still to come, the International Space Station forced to change course because of space junk, and China launches its 92nd reconnaissance spy satellite. Why does it need so many eyes in the sky? All that and more coming up on Space Time.
the International Space Station has been forced to make an unscheduled course correction in order to avoid a possible collision with a piece of space junk. The Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos fired up the orbital manoeuvring engines of its Progress MS-14 cargo ship, which is docked to the orbiting outpost, in order to carry out the course change. The burn lasted about 100 seconds, increasing the station's orbital velocity by about half a metre per second and its orbital altitude by about 900 metres, safely avoiding the space debris. The European Space Agency says there are now some 34,000 objects more than 10 centimetres in size orbiting the Earth. And there are further 900,000 objects between 1 and 10 centimetres in size. And a further 128 million objects a centimetre or less in size currently circling the planet. And all of these are travelling at around 28,000 kilometres an hour. It seems wherever humans venture, they leave their rubbish behind. This is Space Time. Still to come, China launches its 90-second reconnaissance spy satellite. And later in the science report, confirmation of a new, more contagious variant of the COVID-19 virus. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China's armada of spy satellites is continuing to expand with the launch of two more high-resolution reconnaissance satellites. The first to fly was the Gofeng multi-mode imaging spacecraft, which was launched aboard a Long March 4B rocket from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in northern China's Jiangxi province. The spacecraft's equipped with a large aperture long-focus high-resolution camera designed to provide sub-millimeter level full-color images and features a multispectral imager and atmospheric synchronization calibrator to reduce the impact of cloud and fog. As well as its military intelligence gathering applications, some of the spacecraft's features will also be made available for selected civilian users approved by the Chinese Communist Party. The mission also carried the Xiaobei Pole 8102 Aerospace Education Satellite, which is carrying a range of scientific and technical experiments for school students. Then, just two days later, Beijing launched another reconnaissance satellite aboard a Long March 2D rocket, this time from the Zhuhuan Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Inner Mongolia. Beijing have classified all details about the Xi'an 602 satellite. The Chinese state-run media simply described it as an experimental remote sensing satellite intended for space environment study and related technology experiments. Beijing used the same description for the Yo Gang series military reconnaissance satellites. This latest launch brings to 92, the number of reconnaissance spy satellites now being operated by China to monitor what other countries on the Earth below are up to. The flight was also the 338th launch of a Long March series rocket. This is Space Time. And time to take another look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Back in early May, news broke about a reportedly new, more contagious variant of the COVID-19 virus. That story was based on a piece of non-peer-reviewed research independently published online. The preprint stated this new variant of the virus had a particular mutation in its spike protein which made it more transmissible than other forms, thereby representing an urgent concern for containment and vaccine development. Now, a revised and peer-reviewed version of the same paper reported in the journal Cell has additional data, still showing the strain to be more infectious but it's not yet known if that means it'll be more transmissible or will lead to a more severe disease. As a result, it's not known if this new strain has had a meaningful impact on the COVID-19 pandemic. A new study has found that an increase in carbon dioxide emissions equivalent to 5 million cars a year has been caused by the loss of seagrass meadows around the Australian coastline since the 1950s. The stark findings were made possible by new modelling carried out by marine scientists at the Centre for Marine Ecosystems Research at Edith Cowan University. A report in the journal Global Change Biology calculated that around 161,150 hectares of sea grass had been lost from Australia's coastline since the 1950s, resulting in a 2% increase in annual carbon dioxide emissions from land use change. 
Scientists say a new semi-transparent solar cell that could be incorporated into window glass is set to become a game changer that could transform architecture, urban planning and power generation. A report in the journal Nano Energy claims scientists from the ARC Centre of Excellence in Excitation Science in Monash University have succeeded in producing these next-generation perovskite solar cells that generate electricity while allowing light to pass through. They're now investigating how this new technology could be built into commercial products with Australian glass manufacturers. The technology will allow two square metres of solar window to generate as much electricity as a standard rooftop solar panel. Rooftop solar is a conversion efficiency of between 15 and 20 percent, while the new semi-transparent cells have a conversion efficiency of 17 percent, while still transmitting more than 10 percent of incoming light. A new study has found that although flowering plants evolved around 100 million years ago, it took them around 50 million years or so to diversify and bloom into the flowers we know today. A report in the journal Nature has documented the evolution of families of flowering plants on a global scale and uncovered a pattern where the diversification of the families of flowers we know and love today and the ecological expansion of these species took place long after the families originated. They found that on average, this lag took between 37 and 56 million years, with plant families living in temperate and arid regions having shorter lags than those from the tropics. The authors say this suggests some type of interaction between evolutionary innovation and ecology in shaping the evolutionary dynamics of flowering plants. Researchers at the University of Harrisburg claim to have developed artificial intelligence software capable of predicting whether a person is likely to commit a crime. And it does this simply by looking at their face. The authors claim their program has an accuracy rate of 80%. But Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the claims are hauntingly similar to phrenology, wrapped up with a touch of facial recognition. Phrenology goes back to the Nazis. Goes, the Nazis were into all sorts of paranormalities, astrology, Nostradamus, the whole lot. But phrenology probably goes back even further. It goes back to the 1800s. And it was the theory that you can tell someone's personality by the bumps on their head and that different parts of the skull were divided up into various characteristics of someone, you know, grumpiness, sleepiness, dopiness, whatever you want to use it. So that was phrenology. And it's, it's, it's total garbage. But that was what was used. More recently, someone's been putting forward a theory that you can tell someone with a propensity for criminality by the shape of their head and their face and the proportions of their features, which is basically saying you're genetically predetermined to be a, a crim if you have these facial structures, etc. The research reckon they use AI, you know, artificial intelligence software, and that they receive an 80% accuracy rate that whether a person was a criminal just by looking at the face. Obviously, there's major ethical issues with that. And you can sort of start putting people aside just because of the shape of their face. And secondly, though, there's actually sort of research problems with it as well. It's it's just heavily criticised both from an ethical point of view and from a scientific point of view, saying that there's very little really to support these arguments, which has been around for a while. And there's been previous sort of uh, research supposedly showing the same sort of thing. And most of them are very poor and have been highly criticised straight away and criticised scientifically as much as they have been from an ethical or moral point of view. Certainly from a moral point of view, there's, it's, it's an appalling idea that you can sort of predict what someone's behaviour is going to be by the shape of the face and you know, that you know what they're going to do in the future. This is the film Minority Report. is about people predicting what future crimes are going to be and you know, how that gets a bit out of hand. I also remember I was once actually working in a, an Asian country, which I will not name, where they they actually shot some robbers on the way to a robbery because they said they knew they were going to rob something beforehand. So they were just being a bit preemptive there. And that's the trouble with this thing, that this is supposed to be um, preemptive, pre-crime. You can sort of stop people doing something just based on the shape of the face, which is the same as phrenology, which is the shape of the head, the skull. You can tell what someone's going to be like. It's appalling. It's by and large, as I understand it, it's pretty much garbage. Bad software in, bad programming out. Yeah, yeah. What they called Giga, didn't they? Garbage in, garbage out. That depends on what you set the uh, parameters up to record something and you're going to get the result you wanted. I don't know whether these particular researchers, how diligent they were or even if they were just having a joke. But certainly the reaction to it by a lot of people was very, very quick and very and very critical. So much so that they actually took the paper down off, off a website anyway. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. 
Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial-free double-episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through spacetimewithstuartgary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 